webinar before. Um, this installment is one of a four-part series we're offering in partnership with the Paleontological Society, and it has been facilitated via iDigBio's Adobe Connect platform. The next webinar will be on Wednesday, March 29th, with Cindy Lochner, who is an awesome amateur paleontologist from the Florida Fossil Hunters Club and the Florida Paleontological Society. So be sure to add that date to your calendar. You can learn more about our Women in Paleontology webinar series and the Fossil Project in general at www.myfossil.org. And we invite everyone here, if you haven't already, to sign up and participate in the My Fossil community. Before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, this webinar should end no later than 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And the way we intend for this to work is that Brenda will speak for about 30 minutes, after which we will open it up for discussion and questions. So we encourage you to take notes and type your questions in the chat box in order to facilitate question and answer time after the presentation. No one except for the presenter and myself have active microphones, so if you can hear us and see the PowerPoint, then you should be good to go. And if you're having any trouble, um, our simplest method is to just exit out of the program and re-enter Adobe Connect. Um, or if you have other issues, you can chat um, in, type in the chat box um, for technical support. And most importantly, please don't forget to take a short survey after the webinar ends. It's really, really important for us um, for reporting purposes for the National Science Foundation, and we really appreciate your time in taking that survey. So this webinar is being recorded, and both the recording and Brenda's presentation will be made available under the resources section on myfossil.org if you would like to access it later. Uh, lastly, in case you don't already know, by attending or watching the recordings of all four webinars in this series, you can receive a certificate of completion. In order to earn the certificate, you must first be signed in with your full name, remain and participate for the entire hour, and be a member of the MyFossil online community. And if you have any questions, please contact me via the MyFossil website or via email. And so with that, let's turn it over to Dr. Brenda Hunda. Hi, good evening everybody. Um, thank you for joining me. Um, I want to first start out by saying thank you to Eleanor and her team of people uh, behind the scenes tonight and the Fossil Project as well as the Paleontological Society for making all of this possible and for inviting me to give a talk tonight. I'm actually very excited about talking to you all about what my life as a paleontologist is like and, and sort of what that means to me being a woman in this field. I want to start out by just going through a little bit um, of an outline and uh, we're going to start off with sort of one question that people always ask me is why did you become a paleontologist and so I'll, I'll take you way back in in my deep time, so to speak, to my childhood and, and give you a little bit of a background of where I've come from and why I'm so passionate about paleontology. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit about what it means to be a curator. Um, there are historical and modern perceptions of what a curator actually is and we'll define those and talk a little bit about what the roles of those are. And then I'm going to use uh, my museum as, as an example of the specific roles I play within my museum um, and how I see my place um, in my organization. Uh, and then we'll do a little bit of question and answer period. I'd be happy to take both professional related and personal related questions and then we'll do a wrap up. So I wanted to start this off um, really talking about my personal path, but I have a, I have a little uh, confession to make to you before we begin, and that is um, my husband ended up having a work event tonight that was unexpected that um, meant that I had to bring my two-year-old daughter with me to my office uh, because um, he couldn't take her to this event. It was in a restaurant, and uh, we didn't find a babysitter in time. And so my two-year-old is sitting next to me. If you hear her little voice, that's, that's, um, that's her. And I, I mention this um, just because actually it's sort of fortuitous that this would happen with this particular event in my life because I'm very passionate about talking to um, career women, particularly early career women, about the roles that we have in terms of being professionals um, and mothers. And so uh, there's always a balancing act, um, if you will, on, um, 
on that role, and I think everyone handles it a little bit differently, but um, we'll talk a bit more about what it means for me to be a professional paleontologist um, and a mother at the same time a little bit later on in the talk. So it's just kind of funny that that, that ended up being this way. <laughs> um, so to start off with, uh, you know, my personal path, yeah, I was that kid that loved dinosaurs. Um, if uh, you would have asked my mother how old I was when I first wanted to declare that I wanted to be a paleontologist, it was probably around three, maybe earlier. Who knows? Um, it's something that I've always wanted to do. It's a lifelong dream of mine. And I, I grew up sort of in the middle of nowhere, uh, mostly in Saskatchewan, um, Canada. And I've got, I just want a couple pictures here of an Air Force base that I grew up on uh, for most of my formative years. Um, and, and you can see in those pictures that there's not a whole lot going on. <laughs> um, in fact, I think that building in the very front there on the top picture is actually the PMQ that I lived in. It's called the Permanent Military Quarter. And from those back windows uh, was the view that you see in the bottom picture. My father was our, in radar. He was responsible for monitoring NORAD airspace uh, for the Canadian military. And um, as you can see, a lot of wide open expanses of space, which was really, really great for me um, to kind of explore, run around, have the freedom to sort of explore my natural world, um, both in terms of the geology of the area and also the biology of the area. So for me, it was a really excellent breeding ground for my loves of science. Uh, but also, there wasn't a lot of resources there for me. I didn't have museums to really go to. I didn't have um, a lot of educational programs that focused on paleontology or dinosaurs. So for me, my gateway to paleontology was reading. And I read a lot of books. Um, and, and maybe the Flintstones, if any of you <laughs> remember the Flintstones, might have also helped that a little bit. But really, my, my gateway to paleontology and the love of the natural world um, were definitely books. But I moved to Edmonton, Alberta, Canada uh, when I was 10 years old. And um, that really changed things for me. It, it sort of confirmed to me what I really wanted to do when I went to the Tyrell Museum of Paleontology um, in the eighth grade. And uh, this, of course, was a place full of dinosaur skeletons. And right away, I knew I wanted to be a vertebrate paleontologist. And that was it. And lucky for me, I just happened to land in a town that had a very top-rated paleontology program. So I was able to get a BSc specializing in paleontology, specifically as an honors program, from the University of Alberta. And a master's of science in geology from that same place. Denise, please be quiet, Annie. So um, for me, really was. Um, Anise, please, honey, was kind of important because I was told as an undergraduate that women didn't actually belong in the field and that for me, I shouldn't be a paleontologist. And I was told this actually by my undergraduate advisor. And I decided to not listen to that advice and to actually pursue my love and change from my love of vertebrate paleontology to invertebrate paleontology and pursued my master's degree in trilobite paleontology, which was a, a different direction for me, but something that actually ended up working out really, really well. I then moved on to my PhD in Earth Sciences um, from the University of California in Riverside. And I was hired at Cincinnati Museum Center a year before I graduated with my PhD. So I actually feel like my path to my current position had a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, meeting people at the right time. Um, stars aligning, if you will, um, and, uh, and I've been at the Museum Center ever since for the last 13 years. So when I first got to school, um, for me, my ideal position was a professor at a university. Um, I felt for me that lecturing and teaching and doing research uh, really was sort of the, the, the if you will, the highest place I could be as a paleontologist. Um, and then I started as a student working in museums and seeing what museum collections were all about and learning what the role of a curator is. Uh, historically and traditionally, when people talk to me about curators, they, they tend to think of people who are more behind the scenes in a museum. They may come out 
after hours to install an exhibit. Uh, they tend to traditionally be behind walls. The public cannot interact with them. They are, of course, charged with their institution's collections. Um, oftentimes, they're in basements, in dusty rooms, poor lighting, and that's where they stay. Uh, curates, curators traditionally tend to be more introverted type behind the scenes people. But I think the modern definition of what it means to be a curator today in museums is really couldn't be further from the truth of that. Really, curators are out for public interaction. And this is really important because we are the face of science in organizations such as mine at the Museum Center, uh, whether it be in Florida or the Field Museum or the Natural History Museum. As scientists, we are the people that are doing the science um, that is being translated on the museum floor. So in my particular case, and in many museums around the country, and indeed the world, curators are responsible for a whole host of interactions that happen with the public, whether you're directly giving educational programs on the floor, whether you are interacting with exhibit design and concepting um, and looking at uh, data from target groups and talking to people about it, whether you are giving scientific um, talks in the community as part of an outreach program. Uh, oftentimes, we are the media interface for the museum. So we have roles to play in both TV and radio, and I've done both of those. Um, and now in this day, some of us, I'll just say myself included, may be dragged kicking and screaming when it comes to having to blog and tweet. But <laughs> in all honesty and fairness, that's a huge, huge way to get our word out. And so we are blogging and, and tweeting and, and have Facebook accounts, a lot of social media. Um, associated with our positions here at the museum. And then, of course, also, uh, we are um, oftentimes asked to interact with the public and their questions. I do a lot of fossil identification. I meet a lot of children who are just want to be paleontologists when they grow up and they want to meet somebody. And I really, really do um, enjoy that part of my job. So curators are not really behind the scenes, quiet, dusty, in the back people anymore. We really have a large role to play in not just what the museum does, but also in advancing our science and its content to the public. And that, for me, is one of the most exciting parts of my job. So what it means to be a curator is kind of different. Um, depending on what museum you are in, whether you're in a history museum or a science museum, an art museum. Um, I've got a few of the big ones up here. I've put, of course, Museum Center down there for us. But every museum does it differently. And the role of a curator can be very different from one organization to another. Uh, larger institutions like the Field or the American Museum or the National Museum of Natural History tend to have tenure track curatorial positions. This is basically an academic track with a major focus on research. This is not to say that these curators do not do other things, of course, but that their main focus and charge with their position is much like you would see in a um, university or college, that they do a lot of research. They oversee teams of people that work in the collections and so forth. Um, smaller museums like myself, and, and we're kind of a middle-sized museum, I would say, uh, we don't have tenure-track positions as curators. And research is really not the only or sometimes even the most important focus for the position. Uh, and so while I love research and those components, it's an important part of my job, uh, my current responsibilities are kind of laid out here to give you an idea of the kinds of things um, that I do. Uh, a quarter of my time is really spent on research. And that varies from day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, sometimes I might not get to a paper for months because I have to spend a lot of time developing an exhibit. Sometimes if things are quiet around the museum, I have more time I can devote to research. It's really up to me to decide how I want to allocate that time. 25% of my time is, is dedicated to curation and collections, so actually working with the objects and the specimens, and we'll talk a bit more about that. One thing I'm very passionate about, of course, is education and outreach. That's developing outreach programs for the public. Um, I'm very, very passionate about translating scientific research to the public, and I think that that's something that we really need in this country. And then 25% of it is administrative and personnel. And I'm going to hit this 
administrative personnel thing um, a little bit harder later on in our talk because because I was at a GSA meeting not too long ago back in September uh, at a mentors panel where a whole bunch of people from the geological sciences crossing academia crossing um, museum uh, positions or industry we're talking about the importance of soft skills um, when it when it means uh, we're talking about geologic sciences. And soft skills are actually not soft at all, but they're just not the PhDs and the academic skills. There are things that people look for, such as your ability to write well, or your ability to talk to the public, or your ability to handle personnel issues and people. Um, and these are skills that are very, very, very important and not necessarily taught. Um, in a college or in an academic program, and so we're going to we're going to talk a little bit about how important um, those skills are in developing through writing programs, learning how to speak in public, and so forth, and can be very important for advancing your career, whatever you choose to do, but particularly if you're going into the sciences. Thank you for your patience, everybody, um, as I as I work through my dual role here as a paleontologist and as a mother. <laughs> So when we think about the museum, there is really sort of three main areas that the museum plays um, in our society. And the first one that people are most familiar with is the informal education side of things. Uh, people come to the museum, they see an exhibit, they interact maybe on the floor with an education program. Uh, many, of, many of these programs, of course, tie to state or federal standards for learning. Uh, we do community outreach as well at schools and events. Uh, and this is what people think the museum is really about. But behind the scenes, there are two other really important things that museums do. The first of those is preserve the original history. So I like to think of the collections facility that I work at as your grandmother's basement or attic. When you wonder where your family archives are or you go into your grandmother's basement and open boxes and see old photos of families or the old record players she had or maybe even old clothing from the 50s, this is all part of your family history. Our job is to collect that as part of our regional history, whether it's specifically to our region, Cincinnati in our case, um, in terms of how Cincinnati developed culturally, maybe infrastructure, businesses, natural history. That is, what was the what is the natural history of the region and how has it changed over the years? So in, in our case, we have extensive zoological collections that track changes of species in the area relative to, to environment or human impact. And all of these are really, really important so that we can begin to understand how the developed of our area actually happened. We'll talk a bit more about that. And then, of course, there's contributing to global scientific knowledge. So in our case, at this museum, and not every museum does this, the scientists are charged with an independent research program. That is, is that as scientists, even though we're not tenure track, we are required to publish, we are required to get grant funding to support our research, and we are required to give national and international talks as well, just like any other scientist would do. Thank you, Sherry, for your support. I really appreciate it. You too, Linda. And Victor. Thank you, guys. <laughs> OK. So I want to spend a little bit of time just going through some of the things that we do here in each of these categories at the museum. And the first, of course, is floor programming. These are some of the things that I've had a hand in either starting, developing, or continuing to develop. So we have a Girls in Real Life Science program. It's actually a STEM science program where we target girls, not to the exclusion of boys. They're welcome as well. Um, but we do focus the program on girls, getting them interested in the sciences. Um, so this is a program that I started developing with some of my educators to get girls um, really more involved in what it means to be a scientist or an engineer or a mathematician um, and get them interested. And it's really, really taking off very well. I'm very, very proud of that. Um, we also work to bring families into more inquiry-based learning. So rather than just reading a panel and pressing a few buttons, uh, we developed the Light Lab, 
learning innovation technology education that allows people to explore and experiment on their own and come up with their own solutions to problems. And we found that this inquiry-based learning program where people are given guidance but allowed to figure things out for themselves uh, has been a very, very big success. Uh, we also have an adults program, the Insights Lecture Series. Many places have lecture series um, as well, and we invite speakers from all over the country primarily, sometimes different countries, to come in and give science talks once a month to our public, and that's free to the public, and, uh, and we have a lot of really, really great lectures. So we're, we're very excited about that. Exhibit development is not something that I was ever taught about in school. You don't go to graduate school to learn about how to make an exhibit. Um, and you certainly don't go to graduate school to really learn how to talk about your science to the public, which actually takes some skills. And so for me, exhi exhibit development, as exciting as it is, um, was a little bit of a learning process. And I actually truly, truly do enjoy translating the science that we know and love to the public in this in this venue. So a couple of examples. Um, whenever we have a, an exhibit come through, regardless of what the content is, a curator, um, more often than not, in that particular area, is asked to help supplement that exhibit with local or regional content. We like to bring all the exhibits that we have back to the relevance of why it matters to the Cincinnati area. And so an example of that would be Ultimate Dinosaurs. We had uh, an exhibit on dinosaurs from Gondwana, the Southern Hemisphere, and while we have, we've been in the Southern Hemisphere <laughs> for sure, um, we don't have any fossils that are dinosaurs from this region. So we supplemented the Ultimate Dinosaurs exhibit with understanding our own paleontological record here in Cincinnati, which is a, a very, very rich record, and allowed me to be the lead curator on Cincinnati Under the Sea, a small exhibit um, about our own local paleontological resources 450 million years ago. And lead curator for me means, and it, it varies by curator, that I'm involved in every aspect of this. I write, I write the copy. I pick the colors, I work with our exhibits team to build if I have to, um, I'm in the design and floor plan stage, and then I'm also in the implementation stage. I am interested in actually putting things in cases and designing the cases and presenting the objects and, and then training staff and volunteers on those exhibits and then talking to the public about them as well. So an excellent outreach opportunity. And so as part of that community outreach, I spend a lot of time, usually a couple times a month, going somewhere to talk to people about anything essentially they want to hear related to the sciences. Um, I, I do a lot of training of staff and volunteers about um, our local geological resources. So I've done things for various nature groups um, in the area. The Cincinnati Zoo I've worked with. I've worked with science groups. I've done classroom talks about paleontology at, at career days and at science fairs because everybody wants a paleontologist to come and talk about their job at a career day. <laughs> and when they find out you're a paleontologist, I've even done it at the daycare of my daughter. So that was a lot of fun. And I also do tours of the collections facility for school groups and nature groups and the public. Um, and uh, and um, I think that's a really great, rewarding aspect of my job. And George, I see your question, and I'm going to get to it. So as part of the second thing that we do at the museum, we preserve our original natural history. Um, we, I take this job very, very, part of my job very seriously. So I work at a separate facility from the main museum. The, the top picture is our Union Terminal. It's an Art Deco train station built in the 30s that is the hub of our museum. But our collections facility is actually housed about a mile away at a 70,000 square foot facility known as the Geyer Collections and Research Facility. And in that, we have history and science, archaeology, zoology, all kinds of manuscripts, books, photograph collections. We have about 5 million objects in this building. Uh, but we have 
the, one of the largest late order division collections in the world. It's about 500,000 specimens strong, although not all of that is from the late order division. We do focus on the Cincinnati area because of our wonderful um, collections here, but uh, no collection is an island. Science is global, and so we do have a, a global collection of specimens from all over the world in about the 600, last 600 million years of geologic time. So we've got a pretty good, pretty good spread there. So as far as actually working in the collections, there's a lot of different things that we do in collections management. And all of this is really, really critical. And, and let me start by saying that collections management is a lot of paperwork sometimes. But it's important for us to take care of our object libraries, because it's these libraries from around the world that come together that give scientists the ability to address global questions. Without these objects in museums around the world and without good knowledge of what we actually have, it's going to be hard to start addressing global questions um, such as climate change and biogeography and all kinds of amazing things that scientists want to do. So I view my collections part of my job as a service to my community of scientists, a very important service that I take very seriously. And so I'm very proud of the accomplishments that we have made in the collections. So it starts out anything from just cataloging specimens, giving a specimen a number and tracking it through a system, through loaning uh, specimens to researchers around the world, uh, acquiring new material through donations or research, uh, using computer skills, so um, something you're not taught in school, databasing. Uh, we use a program called KEEMU that um, allows us to track all the activity related to our specimens. Uh, Georeferencing, a, a hot new thing these days that National Science Foundation is giving a lot of funding for. Um, things like uh, putting latitude and longitude data on specimens is very important, photography of material, grant writing. So a lot of this stuff is supported by organizations such as the National Science Foundation that have specific programs designed to support collections initiatives in museums. Uh, future forecasting is really, really important. What I mean by this is that we may have a good solid collection in, a, in enough storage space now, but when we take material in in our collection, our job is to maintain it forever. So we need to be thinking 10, 20 years in advance of the resources we're going to need to maintain this collection as it continually expands. Um, are my favorite thing, budgeting. <laughs> uh, nobody really likes budgeting. Um, it's a very important part of the job as well. And personnel management. This is, these are some of the soft skills that I had mentioned when we're dealing with the public and also with volunteers. And I see that some of you have questions um, about uh, working with the amateur community, so I'll happily address those. Uh, I will say right now that we are very proud that our invertebrate paleontology collection is about 97% cataloged and fully online. Uh, Deborah, you can find it actually at the IDIG Bio website. We just the last, uh, I want to say three months ago, uploaded our database to the IDIG Bio program as part of a National Science Foundation initiative. And we are very pleased that we are part of that network of global institutions. Um, and so something to be very, very proud of. So in order to get things done, on the scale that we like to, it really takes a village, essentially. And, and this is part of having community collaborations. The museum is very, very dedicated, very dedicated to enhancing our community collaborations, either through amateur paleontological groups, private corporations, community like U University of Cincinnati and other area other area organizations and institutions. And one thing that we actually do is we bring students in to work as part of an internship. They get credits for museum curatorial work. I get help in the collection, and they get experience working in the museum and are able to put that on their resume. Uh, so it's a win-win for everybody and certainly um, helps the student advance their careers if they're interested in a museum role uh, and, uh, and helps us um, get some of the, the backlog, if you will, um, of work that needs to be done because 
collections work is a is a never ending a never ending um, project. We also here in Cincinnati are really proud of our community collaborations with local amateur paleontological societies. Uh, we have two big ones here. This is by no means is the only two in the list, but some of you may be familiar with the Dry Dredgers and the Kentucky Paleontological Society. These are very dedicated amateur geologists and paleontologists that have become friends of mine over the last 20 or so years. Many of these people have been looking at the rocks and fossils in Cincinnati longer than I've been alive. And they are an absolute wealth of knowledge, not only just in terms of fossil hunting, but the scientific importance of many of these specimens. And so a really great collaborative relationship between amateurs and professionals in this area, not just with me, but also with professors up at the University of Cincinnati, um, strengthens the relationship to the point where we can trust that our amateurs are going to not only support what we do, we can rely on them to help us, but are going to be our eyes and ears for things, particularly really excellent specimens in the field. You know, um, as a paleontologist, I do go out in the field, but I don't get out a whole lot. And I, when I'm in the field, I tend to look for certain things. Um, and I have amateurs that are bringing me all this amazing fossil material because they know how important it is um, for scientists and oftentimes, these amateurs are in collaboration with scientists. Many of these people are published. And they publish with professionals. So they take this very, very seriously. And, um, and I am um, indebted to their support in this area. And so this comes to one of the sort of the soft, softer skills um, about about being a curator, um, and that is managing personnel, whether it's volunteers, like some of my longtime volunteers here who have been with me since I started at the museum, or students. Uh, people, people are people, and they have personalities. And these require the ability to work with those personalities. And so sometimes um, that requires uh, a certain, you know, amount of, of skill, if you will, trying to be um, as uh, tactful as I can about it. And, uh, and these are the kinds of skills that are not taught um, in college. How to be a people person, how to deal with personnel issues. Volunteers are, are very engaged in what we do. They have an in-depth knowledge of the local area and the region. Um, they are dedicated to it. They have time. And they also bring resources to the collections. Uh, so I could not do what I, <laughs> Jack, could not do what I do if I didn't have my volunteers. There's absolutely no way. And so um, I certainly need to thank them and give them a shout out because uh, they're very, very important to our initiatives, not just in terms of collections, but also having relationships with our organization, with the museum itself. Uh, we have excellent art re relationships to the point where they help us develop educational programs. They support exhibit development. Um, and so we're very, very proud um, of that. And to answer some of your questions that I'm seeing here on, on, the, on the record here, we do have a museum without walls. So we recently added our collections to the IDIG Bio program, as I mentioned, um, to make our data available for anybody globally who wants to access from a central database um, data for millions of biological and paleontological specimens. And we're very, very proud of that. You can see our little our little uh, in the upper left hand corner there, um, our little uh, page about our data that's in the IDIG Bio program. And so the third thing that's very important is that we have an independent research program here. And my research, I'm going to kind of go this kind of quickly because I know that we're we're low on time here. Uh, my research really focuses on looking at trilobites um, in the Cincinnati area right now, and um, looking at how their morphologies change and how that morphology changes in relationship to um, looking at geography, where they are occurring in space, and through geologic time. And so I'm interested in trying to understand what variation in populations, um, how that leads to speciation, or how that leads to how we interpret morphological change in the fossil record. 
And I use trilobites in Cincinnati because there's quite a lot of them, and I can find them fairly easily. And I use a technique called geometric morphometrics, where I mathematically model the shape of trilobite heads, and I look at how those mathem mathematical models compare with other samples from other places over space, say over the course of 100 kilometers in the same bed, or through geologic time. In our case, within about 2 million years. And you can see that when you get a lot of samples, you can get a pretty good idea of the variation in those samples. I've got a kind of a cloud here of all of these landmarks, as they are called, on the, the head of the trilobite. And you can see that they're not all the same, right? Because there's natural variation in a population. And that natural variation in this population of 824 trilobites is expressed as this cloud of data. We can then look at mathematical models that um, decipher shape changes through time. So the arrows represent the magnitude and direction of shape change through a sequence. This is through uh, a, a 2 million year interval of geologic time. And we can see it that the arrows are telling us that the head is changing shape um, in various components throughout this time. And, and what I'm interested in is trying to understand what this means. How do we dissect this for the processes that are underlying this? And then how does that help us interpret these patterns in the fossil record? And, and linking that to environment, what are the causes, if we can, of these shape changes? And one way that we do that is we use the one way that we do that is we use the fossils that the rocks um, contain to help us understand the environments these animals are living in. And we can create these proxies for environment based on faunal distributions. And we can track those through time to give us essentially what are water depth curves, how water depth changes through a series of rock layers through time, as we see these squiggles here. Um, are basically recording changes in the water depth at one particular locality. And then we can track those trends to see how that morphology varies in space and time. And so this is a small subset of data showing the different localities and the different samples that are color coded. And you can see that um, the clusters of colors, the yellow cluster, is very different from the red cluster, which is different from the orange cluster, which is kind of similar to the samples from the, the brownish-red cluster there. And that allows us to look at how these trilobites change in what's referred to as morphospace and what the relationships of um, water depth or environment are to those changes. And that gives us not just a pattern, but a process on how, ver how variation of morphology changes through geologic time. Of course, trilobites are my main bread and butter, but I have done work with students on other animals. And so I just throw up a couple of examples here about looking at growth and development in sea scorpions. That was uh, an awfully fun project with a student of mine, trying to understand how sea scorpions um, change their shape um, as they grow. And also, I did some work on crinoids, looking at um, how crinoids are preserved and what that means for how we interpret um, these fossils in the fossil record. Uh, that, that particular study is known as taphonomy. And um, it's really the study of, of everything from the point at which an animal dies to the point it becomes uh, preserved in the rock record to the point where it's exposed um, for study and the processes that underlie basically that fossilization process. It does look like a lot like a plant. <laughs> and this in independent research program has led me to so many places in the world. I've just got a few here, uh, places that I've been able to give talks, like Prague and the Czech Republic and Argentina. I'm actually digging out a fossil fish up there, and you can see my favorite picture of the camel staring at me.
Um, and then also being in Vietnam, looking for Ordovician trilobites was a fantastic experience as well. So one of the benefits of my job is that I get to travel the world and have these amazing, wonderful experiences. Um, and I throw the picture of Vietnam in there with the, with the guys pushing the truck because I don't think a field experience is really a field experience unless you've either got stuck in the mud or you've gotten bitten by some blood-sucking organism that you don't recognize. <laughs> and Vietnam certainly was that. And as part of my professional uh, responsibilities as well, and being a member of a community that I truly appreciate and want to support, I'm actually also lead editor of the Journal of Paleontology and a member, council member of the Paleontological Society. So for me, serving my community in some capacity, whether it is as a curator in collections or facilitating other people's research through publication, is something that I'm very, very proud of. And what this job affords me to do is it allows me to basically touch almost every aspect of what it means to be working in a museum. Um, I work with philanthropy to raise money. I work in exhibits. I deal with informatics when it comes to disseminating data. I work with marketing to talk about programs. Um, I deal with people, so I'm working with human resources. I do my own accounting. I work in collections, education, and research, as we talked about. So there really is very little that I am not involved in as a scientist on staff here. And professionally, as a result of working in this organization, I get to work with a whole host of organizations, whether it be universities, other museums, um, whether it's things like TV and radio, natural uh, history societies, the National Park Service, um, you name it. Uh, I have a lot of, of great collaborative relationships with many of these organizations. And so um, for me, that's really, really important. So to finish off, I want to talk a little bit about balancing my personal life and my professional life. And as I've demonstrated tonight, it's not always easy <laughs> to do. Um, but I really feel it's very important that young career women who are thinking about scientists or even just whatever path it is that you're on, that you can do it all, that you can have everything. You don't have to choose being a mother versus being a professional. And, um, you know, I knew in my life that I wanted to get my PhD and establish my career before I had children, so I knew that I was going to um, be a little bit of a later than life, life later in life mother. Uh, this picture is a picture of my husband, my two boys, Tom and Paul, and my daughter and niece, and who's with me here. And um, and so I knew that was going to be the balance that I was going to have to strike. Of course, now that I am a mom, um, they always come first, but uh, but here I am, you know, with my daughter in tow, working um, working on this project. So um, it really is a personal choice and how you balance it, but, and it's not always easy, but it's definitely possible and it's definitely rewarding. So I just want to get that out there for everybody who is wondering um, how you, you make those decisions. Okay, we have some time for questions, I hope, and um, thanks for listening and letting me blab on a little bit there, and thank you so much for your patience um, when I was uh, trying to get my daughter all organized there a few times. I really appreciate it. No worries whatsoever. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, we do yeah. have a bunch of questions. Um, and so let's first uh, get started with um, what dinosaurs or other creatures inspired you to become a paleontologist? Ah, well, I think, I don't think I'm super extraordinary when I say the big theropods were probably the most exciting to me. Um, at the time that I was growing up, um, they had found a big T-Rex in Saskatchewan, which is now named Scotty, um, and that, that was kind of big news. Um, and so T-Rex and the big theropods were sort of my gateway um, into being a paleontologist. Incidentally, when I, when I moved to Alberta, um, I actually went into the Badlands near Drumheller, Alberta, and was able to find dinosaur um, fossils. And oftentimes, I would come across hadrosaurs. Uh, that was a, quite a common um, dinosaur to have out there. So I guess I would say that they kind of inspired me, too. 
Great, thank you. Um, another question is, in the uh, picture in which you had examples from the Museum Center exhibits, what is happening in the picture where everyone is wearing goggles? Okay, let me go back and see. Uh, goggles, goggles, goggles. I think they're doing a, f oh, this one here. They're doing some kind of foam experiment. I actually was not there for that particular program, but they're probably talking about the physics of foam and surface tension and expansion and all that kind of stuff. I think that would be my, my guess on that one. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Another question, I believe this one was from George, and I know that you touched on it a little bit, um, but maybe you can go into a little bit more detail. How do you work with amateur paleontologists? Yeah, so the best answer to that is really well and very closely. <laughs> um, I have amateur paleontologists that volunteer with me in the collections um, every Tuesday and Friday. A shout out to Jack, I know he's listening. And, um, and so I see them, you know, weekly. Sometimes I'm a little busy and I don't get down there as much as I would like, but um, I'm definitely I'm definitely talk to them weekly, and also uh, I work with them in um, well they support us in terms of educational programming. Uh, we also work together on exhibit development and design. So you saw the Cincinnati Under the Sea exhibit; they were um, a very important component of making that come to life. This one here that we see that for uh, not only for their support. Uh, financially, but also their knowledge. Um, and we also attend meetings as well and give talks to their club. Um, so we work very, very closely with them. Excellent. Um, another question that sort of follows up with that, I believe, was from Linda. And she was asking um, if you partner with doing cataloging um, and photography. And she had an example from working with UT um, and how it's a really beneficial partnership. And I imagine that that's the case for the Cincinnati Museum Center. Um, you mean in terms of, uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, partnering with um, a university? Well, well, with the amateur community that's in the area. Oh, yes, yes. It's very, very important. So um, actually, the vice president and the president of the Dry Dredgers volunteer with me and do all of those things in the in the collection and so uh, yeah it's very very uh, very very important and fruitful relationship I think um, for for both of us excellent um, okay here's a question that's a little bit more specific how do you pick a way to label fossils in the collections is it by date is it by founder name initials and a number or what's what's the uh, process Okay, um, museums do this a little bit differently, but in our organization we use a catalog number. Um, this number is basically the next number in the sequence that we have. So for instance, uh, right now we're working in the 74,000 and, and so we basically give it a prefix. Our prefix at our museum is CMC, since I'm Museum Center, IP, Invertebrate Paleontology, and then we give the specimen a number. In this case, it might be 74,576. And then the next specimen would be CMC IP 74,577, and, and so forth. Um, and so we track them that way. We also give them an accession number. Um, the accession number is a number that is given when a specimen comes into the collection and is donated. And that way we can track along with that specimen number um, the provenance and the origin of how we got that material into the collection. But the catalog number is the main number that we use for tracking um, you know, if it's used in a program or in exhibits, or where it is in the collection physically, all of that is tracked through that catalog number. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Linda actually just asked a follow-up question to that. Um, right. Does the catalog entry include the name of the person who donated it? And um, so, what do you, is that typical? Yeah. Yes, so <laughs> I would say that in the past, uh, prior to 20 years, maybe museum rec records are a little bit more on the spotty side, um, but certainly since I've come in, um, and so the two curators before me, I think, um, made a really big effort to make sure that we tracked um, the, the donor 
or the collector um, of specimens as they come in. And this is interesting that you mention this because we do not infrequently get family members of people who have passed away who have donated material in their will asking to come back and see it um, because they want to see what you know where their fossils ended up of their loved one and the only way to really track that um, is to uh, is to put the donor's name with it so we're very very um, careful about doing that thank you elf museum classroom I really enjoyed having you yes it was great to have them for sure and thank you for that answer. yeah um, another question that came in is what software is used with IDIG bio is it open source Huh, that's a good question. I don't believe it is open source. Um, remember we talked about that informatics collaboration that I have at the museum? They are definitely the people who would know the answer to that. So I would have to look a little bit more into that. Um, also contacting iDigBio would be a way to get that answer. Um, I worked with my informatics people to facilitate that relationship. Um, I gave them the data. They they formatted it to the proper format to get it up to iDigBio. I will say it was quite a process um, to do all of that because our data was not um, basically is Darwin Core, which is required um, language for the two databases to talk to each other. But once that was completed, we were uh, on the way. So um, I definitely would talk with iDigBio for more details on that side of things. I wish I could give you a better answer than that. Oh, no, 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 that, that's good. And we can also provide contact information on the My Fossil website um, to get connected with iDigBio Absolutely. for those who want to learn more. Um, an excellent question that came in, I believe, from Sherry was, you're able to have kids in a career, but how is it possible for young paleo people to do field work and have a family too? Right. So I think one of the, it's hard to address that for everybody. Um, clearly, having a network of support is really crucial. Um, I chose to wait a little bit till later in life to start my family because I knew that my early career was going to be filled with more field work um, than my later career and even now as my kids are getting to be older I'm able to sort of re-evaluate and do more field work than I used to when they were very very young um, but I think a support network is the most important thing. Surround yourself with people family members, spouses, friends that can help because oftentimes we're in the field for three weeks at a time and in places that have not a lot of great communication and sometimes you know it's very hard to get back to home so if you have an excellent family support network who are supportive of your career choices um, then hopefully they'll be supportive of your family choices as well and like I said for me I didn't have that so my choice was to wait until I could get settled in order to be able to do the field work that I wanted to do. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think that was an excellent answer. I see um, that Olivia said something about needing to have her question answered and she asked quite a few. Um, I think perhaps the one she's looking for is the first one she asked, what's your view on changing DNA with CRISPR-9? Huh. <laughs> well, I can't say that I'm exactly more informed than the average person on that um, relative to just re listening to NPR stories about it. Uh, you know, uh, because I don't work with DNA, honestly. It's not a field that I'm super, super familiar with. I know that it's going to become more prevalent and that they're starting to do it, um, you know, more genetic modifications. Um, in the foods that we eat and so forth and the main concern of course is the ethics behind that um, to be honest I'm kind of just waiting and seeing how things are going to go um, and what that's going to look like for us uh, I think that there is a with everything that we do as we advance science there is an application that could be appropriate for such technology as long as the ground rules and the boundaries are clearly defined and set. And 
being able to explore CRISPR and DNA genetic modification and the things, the tools, the tool that offers us all these science advances is exciting, but the scientific community is going to have to get together and decide what are the limits to using this tool. And of course, one, one potential limit there is, you know, do we do it on human embryos and humans for disease and so forth and modify DNA that way. So, so I think it remains to be seen um, how the scientific community is actually going to decide what those boundaries are. Uh, and I'm paying attention. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I do see that we are out of time. It is 8 o'clock. Um, so I just want to mention as we are finishing up here to please take the survey. You can see that you can click it live. Um, to take the survey and make sure that you put March 29th with Cindy Lochner um, on your schedules so that you can join us for the next one. Brenda, thank you so much. This has been an excellent uh, presentation and a, a great q and I'm sorry that we were a little short on time, but I think it was really informative. And uh, thank you to everybody for coming. Yeah, thank you. And once again, thank you so much for your patience as I um, dealt with Anise and her and her needs and I really appreciate you all coming out tonight. Thank you.